I'm going to catch me a whale. Not here on the sea, but up in the stars, which is where Moby Dick really lives. Before we leap straight in and tackle the huge whale of Moby Dick, I think we'll take a slightly roundabout route and look at a dolphin first, the constellation Delphinus. It's a very small constellation and easy to see once you know how to locate it. And there's a couple of images in it that will prove very relevant to our search for Moby Dick. Constellation Delphinus is made up of just a few stars and in it we can find a running figure and from Carol's hunting of the snark, we find a hasty parenthesis and a close-up of a, a shouting face. Basically the nose and the wide open mouth with the tongue flicking out. These take a little bit of working on. You need to train your eyes to see the same stars in different ways. But that's how the storytellers used to do it. One set of stars can have various images related to it. And that's how the, the stories were built up. So Delphinus, the dolphin. And here's something that's particularly pertinent to our sperm whale. To ejaculate is also to cry and to shout. So here's the little running figure in Delphinus. There's the shouting or crying or ejaculating figure. Now, look at this. This belongs to the High Father in Heaven, the father of Ishmael, who was the firstborn son of Abraham. Now, if we take a look at the bigger picture, there's a the square of Pegasus. Set us the whale, which gives us the knowledge that there is a whale in this area. Aries, the curve of Andromeda leading to Perseus and the frisky fish. Starting with the frisky fish, use all the bright stars of Andromeda and Pegasus and Aquarius to form a huge sperm whale. The location of the um, ejaculating penis, I'm fairly sure, is the reason why the sperm whale was called a sperm whale originally. The eye of the whale is perfectly positioned too. Stars in just the right place. And the four stars at his snout form the blowhole. Well, technically, on a sperm whale, it's in the right place, but it should be uh, on the left-hand side of his snout. The Prince of Wales has this badge as his emblem, constituting three ostrich feathers, which is perhaps the closest terrestrial likeness of a whale's blow that you could possibly find. And to back this up, we have Le Dauphin, who is the first son of a French king. So the first son of an English king or queen is the Prince of Wales, while the first son of a French king or queen is Le Dauphin, the dolphin. It's hard to think of an earthly explanation, but up here in the stars, because this little fellow is Ishmael, the first son of Abraham, or indeed our father in heaven, then it's uh, fairly likely that the reason for these terms it derives from the, these particular pictures in the stars. Well, let's just tie a couple of loose ends up here, because if we go back to the ejaculated child image of Delphinus, there's a little curiosity that we need to deal with. Delphinus is also known as Job's Coffin. Now, I think coffin might be a corruption of coughing, because the image suggests that Job being one of the most afflicted people in the Bible, is coughing. I think that's probably more likely. Job's coffin is in the blow of the whale. So we have a blow job, or a blow job, if you prefer that pronunciation, uh, with all the pictures associated with it. Now, it's a little bit crude, I know, but one of the creation myths uh, involves a god ejaculating into his own mouth. And I think we have the images here behind that particular creation myth. Well, that was a tasty little introduction to Moby Dick. Perhaps not quite what you're expecting. It's a huge book with thousands of uh, star pictures. I, I only know a few of them, really, relatively speaking. Um, we're going to concentrate now on um, Stubb, the, an oarsman who uh, requested the, that stars be painted on his every oar. 
It's a very particular style that he wants, and uh, we're going to see about that in a moment. And uh, after that, we'll just um, take a look at the sinking of the ship, which is a very dramatic picture and massive. It covers a huge area of the night sky. It's uh, quite exciting. Anyway, we'll catch that later. When names and images combined, it makes picture finding an awful lot easier. Stub, for instance, is also a, a verb. It's what happens to your toe if you jam it firmly against something solid. In the east, there's a, what I call the fairy boot. It's an easy to see picture. But if you just rearrange your vision a little bit and take a close look at Auriga, you can see that with the foot, you get a toe at a very awkward angle, a stub toe. Now, stub is also in charge of the oarsman. As a charioteer, which is what Auriga means, uh, you can see the figure as being braced against the motion of a chariot. He's even got a whip in his hand, but that's another story. And it's Stubb who wanted a vermilion star painted on his every oar. And it's the carpenter who symmetrically supplies the constellation. This is a very juicy sentence. Uh, we'll see why in a moment. We've got to look for symmetry, and we've got to look for a constellation that looks like a star. To find the carpenter, you need to look past the bright stars of Orion. Let's take a look at his, the three stars of the belt, because here we find the symmetry. Echoing the three bright stars are the three, three faint stars that make a perfect rectangle. Up here, another set of three faint stars. These indicate an elbow, and it was from this that I actually found the carpenter. Take the bright star as his head, work out the positions of his hands, his elbow, and the saw falls nicely into place with the little string of stars below Orion's belt depicting motion very nicely. Here I've shown a crown being cut in half. This is the crown the lion and the unicorn are fighting over and it also denotes a kingdom or a king. Various options for that. But so how do we get from this to a star? Let's just take a slightly larger view. Carpenter sawing the crown in half here and the sym symmetry of the three bright stars and the three faint stars. If you know how to form the star, which the uh, Star Strike app will show you if you don't get it from here, it's a perfect pentangle in Orion. And it's best seen when the stars are just above the horizon. A little bit lower than here, in fact, would be good. It's a fantastic image, and it's probably the most awesome picture in the night sky. Once you've seen this star, this visually perfect pentangle in the night sky, you'll never forget it. So here's the whole scene, the oarsman of Auriga, complete with oarlock, neat little detail, the star in its location at the end of the oar. The chewed worm provides the vermilion reference. Jacob is referred to as a worm in Isaiah 41:14, and Jacob can be found in this little constellation, or oh, one of his incarnations anyway. Uh, Jacob can translate as the follower, and the main star in the worm is called Aldebaran, the follower. The Mighty Mole is a fantastic image. I'm not going to show the stars here, but it, its nose is in the Pleiades and it curves back into Perseus. It's the mole that makes a mountain out of its diggings. So to the sinking of the ship. Apparently the sinking of the Percod is based on a true story. The sinking of another whaling ship called the Essex. That's where Melville got his inspiration apparently. I'm not so sure. The account of thinking of the Essex sounds very much like a star story to me. There are details in it that don't really make earthly sense. For instance, the whale that sank the Essex charged towards it, thrashing its tail, creating a huge wake. Now this fits the pictures in the stars, but it doesn't fit reality. So I've seen whales moving and their flukes don't come out of the water unless they're sounding. Another detail that sounds very much like a star story is the fact that when the whale struck the Essex the ship trembled like a leaf. Now I'm not sure about you but I think if I was struck by a whale I'd do something more than tremble like a leaf. This fits the stars perfectly because there's a trembling leaf just where the, the ship is struck by the whale. Now the whale strikes the Essex underneath the cat head. So the cat head is at the front of the ship the beam that holds the anchor. 
Now the dictionaries won't tell you why the cat head is called the cat head. They don't know. Sailors would of course because they knew the stars. And it's in the stars we find the cat. And it's under the cat head that the whale strikes the ship. Let's take a look. Now, starting with the big square of Pegasus, find the Andromeda curve back into Perseus. From Perseus, curve down again to the Pleiades, Seven Sisters. Find another curve going out to Aries. And this gives us the back end of the cat, which is stretching out into Pegasus and beyond. It's a beautiful image. Look for a sharp claw in the back foot in Aries. Hey diddle diddle, the cat and the fiddle. Yep, that's this cat. It's also the cat that got out of the bag. Um, in the hey diddle diddle rhyme, the little dog laughs to see such craft. Now the craft word has been confused with various other things, but craft is another word for ship. And it's this ship the little dog is laughing at. Now, how is he laughing? Well, if you translate laugh into Hebrew, you get Isaac. And Isaac, of course, is Ishmael's half-brother. In this area underneath the cat's head is where we find the action, where the whale strikes the ship. Let's take a look. Relocating a lost starship is quite some enterprise. It's not easy knowing where to start amongst this jumble of stars. We need to look for a feature, and the feature that we have is down at the bottom, a little constellation called Capricornus. This actually means the goat, but here we have a perfect bow wave. Now, once you've recognised a bow wave, a ship is sure to follow. It's just a question of piecing the stars together, really. And this one takes a little bit of doing. But these pairs of stars guide your eyes up into the curve for the bow. After that, you can add the bow sprit and, if you like, a cross beam. From there, it's just a question of working out where the gunnels are. Let your eyes follow star patterns. The Aquarius configuration provides an anchor, or indeed the cat head beam. Aquila points up to Lyra, and you find the mast, from which a flag is flying. This flag can extend into Pegasus. The ship's bell is even there, in Sagitta. The crew, Delphinus, who we've met before, and, tied to the top of the mast, Odysseus, trying not to get caught by the sirens. Now the ship is struck by the whale underneath the cat head, where the anchor is. Having struck the ship, the whale passed under the ship, grazing her keel, or it ran quivering along its keel, depending on which story you're looking at. So obviously up in the stars, the whale can't move. But if we look at the bright stars of Andromeda and Pegasus, we find a perfect keel, which the whale is just brushing past. And how does the tr ship tremble like a leaf? Look below again, we find this figure, shivering, quivering or trembling, like a leaf. There we have a beautiful little image of a leaf. Now this can turn into an eye. Look, an eye. I'm putting these together to show you uh, how the storytellers created their stories and their sentences. So we have a cold eye, which is uh, where the Irish got the cold-eyed cat from. And also from Babes in the Wood, the robins cover the dead children's eyes with leaves. That's how these uh, stories were put together. One image built upon another, the words drawn down from the star pictures like this. And so to the final moments of the Perkod. This involves a stooping eagle, a skyhawk, that had tauntingly followed the main truck downwards. Now, I had to look up what a main truck was, and we find it in Pisces, the site of our leaf and the lovely eye. And it's simply a disc. The main truck is a disc that tops the mast, and it's this that the skyhawk came down for, from its natural home amongst the stars. Melville tells us exactly where we should be looking for this story up amongst the stars. Now this poor unfortunate bird got really unlucky because it chanced to intercept its broad fluttering wing between the hammer and the wood. The Milky Way represents the mast beautifully. The hammer you have to look carefully for because you need to see past the brightest stars of Cygnus. It's quite tricky to find. There's the whole scene. As you can see it's a massive a massive scene stretching from well Perseus all the way to Cygnus, Aquarius, 
up the corners. Now there's always one survivor from tales like these, and it's Ishmael. He gets saved by a coffin of all things that pops up out of the water and keeps him buoyed and afloat until he's picked up by the Rachel, searching for her long lost children. There are plenty of curious chapters in Moby Dick, perhaps none more so than The Hyena. This is a chapter where Melville talks specifically about a joke, uh, nothing else really, and uh, there's no mention of a hyena in the chapter at all, it's just the title. Now if we compare this to Lewis Carroll's The Hunting of the Snark, he would joke with hyenas returning their stare, one might start to get the impression that hyenas and jokes are related. Well, they are and the hunting of the snark decoded lets that particular cat out of the bag. <laughs>